Praise God and good morning, Woodside. How's everybody doing today? How many are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? I am so grateful for the way that the Spirit of God is moving in our church and in our midst. And I pray that every time you come into the presence of the Lord and come into the gathering of the saints to lift up the name of our great God and King, that you come with a heart of expectation. Because when we praise him, he promises that he inhabits the praises of his people. And one of the things that I realize is that not only do people everywhere desperately need Jesus, how many can acknowledge that we each desperately need Jesus? How many know that we need him in a very special way? And I want you to know that he is here for us. He's here for us, and he's here not just in the midst of this great auditorium of hundreds of people, but he sees you individually. So I pray that today that you'll experience his presence and his power in an absolutely awesome way and in a tangible way. I am so grateful to be here, and how many are glad to be a part of a church that's alive, that loves God's word, that loves to worship Jesus? and that is um, committed to making sure that people everywhere know the good news of Jesus Christ. And I'll just simply say this, that if you know someone that can uh, be blessed by what we just experienced in worshiping the King, I want to encourage you to invite your friends and family that don't have a church home or that need a church family. You know, I think all of us need two families. One is our biological family. You need them, uh, no matter how crazy they may be. You need them. But secondly, is a church family. We all need a church family, and I praise God for Woodside family. You know, this has been an absolutely incredible week for my wife and I. Many of you know that my wife and I, along with about 30 other members of the Woodside Bible Church family, just got back from Southeast Asia, where we had the amazing privilege of serving our beautiful brothers and sisters in Thailand under the leadership of our partner there, our ministry partner, Aka and the Aka Baptist Church. It was absolutely incredible. One of the reasons why I love our Life Impact ministry, and I encourage you to get connected with Life Impact so you can serve locally or globally. And one of the reasons why I love serving in the global mission field is because every time I go and I come back, I come back spiritually energized and reminded that I am blessed more by them than I think I am a blessing to them. You know, there was some sacrifice that went into going, no doubt. For each one of us, we had to leave family and friends behind for the time when we were in Southeast Asia. It cost on average about $3,000 per person to go, maybe a little bit more than that. To travel there was more than a notion. It's like a 20-hour flight one way. I'm still dealing with the jet lag coming back. But whatever sacrifices we made paled in comparison to how blessed we were from seeing Christ at work among them. By seeing the, the work of the Holy Spirit alive and well in Thailand among the Aka people. There are so many moments that I could share with you that capture how special it was being there. But there's one moment I'll never forget. It was the first day that we went to go visit one of the villages there in Thailand. We were in a Chiang Rai province, province and we were going to a mountain region, a village there called the Punji Village. And when we got there, I got a chance to stand next to Nancy Stewart. Now, some of you know Nancy Stewart, some of you may not, but Nancy is the wife of Dan Stewart, who is the pastor, the campus pastor for our Algonac campus. Nancy and I were standing together presenting the gospel to a group of about 120 Aka men and women. And after Nancy had finished sharing the gospel with them, our interpreter, Aka John, gave them the invitation to make Christ their Lord. And right there on the spot, the good news is 37 men and women made a decision to give their lives to Jesus Christ. To God be the glory and to God be praised. But yet what they did immediately following blew my mind. You know, we had come with doctors, with dentists with a pharmaceutical area for them to receive all these services at no cost to them, absolutely free. There was also a table with glasses, prescription glasses that were donated to us so if they needed that, they can get that. There was food bags that were there for them to get it. But instead of going immediately to receive those goods, they turned to Aka John and they said to him, we want to know more about this Jesus. Tell us about this Jesus. 
It was such a blessing to me because it was as if they were saying, we didn't just come for the free stuff. We didn't just come for those things. We'll get to those things later. What's most important to us is we want to know Jesus. Now, if you've been an American in the global mission field, you know what it's like to go to a country, to go to the needy areas in those countries, and have people convert just so they can get the goods that you brought. In the global mission field, these are called food Christians, individuals, men and women, who come to, to a, uh, an outreach where they can receive free, practical things, and they're willing to convert in order to get those things. And so whenever I'm in a global mission field and I see conversions happen, I'm always a little bit skeptical wondering, is this genuine? But their response confirmed for me that it was genuine. They said, we want to know Jesus. We're not here primarily for the food. We want to know him. And Aka John turned to one of the pastors who's on his team, and he asked that pastor to begin to have a Bible study with them. Folks, that Bible study went for two straight hours. For two hours, they dug into the Word of God. And I looked at Aka John as he watched that take place, and as he explained to me what was going on, and tears filled his eyes and began to roll down his cheeks. And I got to be honest with you, as I watched it, I had dueling emotions inside of my heart. On the one hand, there was this overwhelming sense of joy that I felt by seeing their hunger. But on the other hand, there was this deep sense of internal conviction as I began to ask myself, Chris Brooks, when was the last time you were that hungry? When was the last time you were so hungry for God's Word that, the, that your practical needs became secondary, that even things like eating became secondary, at least for a moment, so that you can commune with your Savior in worship and in the Word? And then my mind began to think about our church, and not just our church, the church in America. And I began to ask myself, when was the last time I seen that type of hunger in an American church, in our church? And I'm not here to insult anybody or make anybody feel bad, but I got to be honest with you. I can't remember the last time I finished a sermon in America and had somebody stop me and say, hey, preacher, that service was just way too short. We want two or three more hours from you. You know, that's every preacher's dream. I'm just going to tell you that right now. But yet there was a hunger that was there. And I began to ask myself another question. What was the difference? What's the difference between their hunger and our lack of hunger, between, between their desire to know this Jesus and our desire to sometimes just uh, have quick or short services? And I began to think that, that maybe the difference is their belief in God's Word. They were convinced, they were absolutely convinced that if we follow the teachings of this Jesus, it will change our lives. I wonder, do we believe that? Because I believe that that is the point of hunger. The point of hunger happens in our lives when we begin to become convinced that if we follow Jesus, it will change everything. That if we follow his teachings, it will change our lives. How many believe that? How many believe that if we follow the teachings of Jesus, it'll change the way we live? How many believe that it'll change the way we love? How many believe that if we follow the way of Jesus, it'll change our marriages, it'll change our friendships, it'll change our church? You know, one of the things we find in the book of Acts is that their earliest group of followers of Jesus, they didn't have much. They didn't have big buildings. They definitely didn't have a big budget. They didn't have any social media. There was no Facebook or, in, uh, or Instagram or Twitter. They didn't have any of those things to market the movement. But you know what they had? They had this deep faith and sense that if we follow the teachings of Jesus, it'll change us. And it did. It didn't only just change them, but it changed the entire Roman Empire as a result of their faith and following of Jesus. And we serve that same God today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. If we would have faith in him and in his word, it can change us and it can change the world we live in. But I wonder if we've misread the text. I wonder if we have somehow misunderstood Jesus. I, I begin to wonder then and, and even now if maybe we have missed the heart of God. 
And that's why I love when we gather together and worship. And that's why I love studying God's Word. I told you when I was with you last time that the goal of studying God's Word is that it will reconnect us with the heart of God. We're not studying God's Word just so we can have fun facts at parties. We're studying God's Word for more than just having notebooks full of notes. We're studying God's Word so that we connect with the heart of the King so that His Word can change and transform us. That's why I love the study that we're in, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. The greatest sermon ever preached is captured in Matthew 5 through 7. Now, we're in the third week of that study. We've entitled this series, Misread, Understanding the Heart of Jesus. And what Jesus is simply doing in the Sermon on the Mount is teaching his followers, his disciples, how to have a blessed life. How to have a life full of joy, a life full of peace, a life that is approved by God. How many want to have that type of life? How many want to have a life full of joy? How many want to have a life full of peace? How many want to have a life that is approved by God? But here's the rub, folks. Here's the challenge. And what made it difficult then and difficult for us now is that everything Jesus teach seems to be counterintuitive and contradictory to the way we're trained by culture. As Jesus teaches the pathway to the blessed life, it's different than the way we've learned on how to have a successful life. And we see that in each verse of the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to see it again today as we read through these chapters or these verses that we get a chance to look at today. What Jesus is actually doing is challenging our hearts and saying that there's something wrong with your heart that causes you to misunderstand my teachings, and that's why it feels so foreign to you. In many ways, what Jesus is revealing to his original audience and to us is that because of the culture that we live in, our hearts are polluted. And when our hearts are polluted, we begin to smuggle in our own self-interest into the text. When we're reading the text, we'll smuggle in some of the other things in our culture that God never intended to be smuggled in. It's as if Jesus is saying, if you want to have a right understanding of the text, you got to have a right heart. You know, when I went to seminary, I took a lot of classes on Bible interpretation. I took classes on hermeneutics. I took classes on the original languages. And all these tools are great for helping you to understand the text. But you know what never showed up in those classes? What didn't show up in those classes was the importance of having a right heart. If you don't have a right heart, you're going to misread Jesus. You're going to miss the heart of God. And Jesus is saying that, we don't, we, that when our hearts are polluted, what ends up happening is we think that our way will lead to life when really our way, apart from him, always leads to death. This is exactly what Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 12 says. There is a way that seems right to you and to me. There is a way that seems right to man, but the end of those ways lead to death or lead to destruction. But I don't want to have a polluted heart. I want to have a clean heart. How many want that, to have a clean heart? And this is what our prayer needs to be, and this is what our desire has to be whenever we go into the text. And so I want you to join me in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look primarily at verses 21 through 48. Now that's 27 big old verses. Now before you get a little bit intimidated by that size of a passage, think about our friends in Thailand and them willing to listen for two hours and just buckle in. I promise you we won't be that long. But let's start in verse number 20. And in verse number 20, Jesus says something that's radical. And I want you to get this, brothers and sisters. Here's what he says. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want you for a moment to think about what this must have sounded like to Jesus' original followers. You're saying to us, Jesus us fishermen and former tax collectors, you're saying that our righteousness has to exceed that of the Pharisees. Now, we use the term Pharisees in our day and age as a derogatory term, but they really, during their time, were the epitome of law keepers. They were the ones that everybody thought were the perfect keepers of the law. So how is it, Jesus, that our righteousness can exceed theirs when they seem to check off every box? What Jesus is talking about is something deeper than rule keeping. 
What Jesus is saying is that your righteousness will never exceed theirs just by religious activities or by you being busy with your hands or you checking off boxes. You're not going to outdo the Pharisees in righteousness by greater legalism. I'm not after your hands. I'm after your heart. The way that you have a greater righteousness is through loving God and allowing God's love to flow through you and aligning your heart with his. Because that's what he's after, folks, because he knows this, that if he captures our hearts, he'll capture our hands. If he captures our hearts, everything else, the whole bundle comes with that. What Jesus is after is our hearts. And if our hearts are not right, we'll misread the text. And if we misread the text, we'll misapply the text. And if we misapply the text, we won't live right. See, Jesus understood that right belief is what leads to right living. But right belief comes from making sure you read the text the way that he intended. And so we're going to read starting in verse number 21. But here's the big idea that we're going to run into as we read through. And that is that Jesus is teaching, Jesus is teaching us the way to have a better life, to to live better and to love better. Jesus' teaching shows us how to live right and how to love right. That's what he's doing here. He's showing us not how to live and love the way that we've been taught. He's correcting the way we've been taught, not only by culture, but even in church at times when we smuggle in cultural philosophies into the text and forget God's original intent. He's getting back to the original intent in the law. So he picks six of the, of the laws of Israel, six of the 613 Mosaic laws. He picks six of them and he reinterprets it for them. He doesn't change the law. He just explains it the way that God originally intended it as an illustration to show them how the Pharisees had twisted the law and caused them to misread it, to misapply it, and to live wrong. He wants to show them how to live better and how to love better, and it starts with understanding the Word of God and its original intent. Look at what he says. He keeps using this powerful phrase, this phrase you'll see over and again, nine times it says, you have heard it said. Verse number 21, he says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. This phrase, you've heard it said, but I say to you, is such a turning point phrase, and I don't want you to miss it. You know, that first part of the phrase, you've heard it said, is the way that Jewish rabbis of that day would have opened up any teaching moment. They would start off a topical teaching by saying, you've heard it said. But when Jesus added the second part of the phrase, but I say to you, what he's doing is correcting the Pharisees. That was a bold move. Correcting the Pharisees during that day would be like correcting the scientific community in our day. They held held sway over the way that people thought. They challenge, when Jesus challenges their teaching, it's the equivalent of Galileo challenging the scientists of his day, saying the earth is not the center of the universe, the sun is. That was radical. It's like Pythagoras who said, hey, the world is not flat in a time when everybody thought the world was flat. He said, no, the world is round. It was challenging the orthodoxy of that day. But Jesus is saying, as authoritative as these Pharisees may seem, they've misread the text, they've twisted the teachings of Moses because they, they, they have wrong hearts. They've smuggled in their own selfishness and they've misread the text and caused you to misread it. So what was Jesus trying to do? He was trying to connect it, uh, correct it and say that I'm of a greater authority. So he uses this, this one simple commandment, thou shalt not murder. 
Now, is that a commandment in the law of Moses? Absolutely. It's the sixth of the Ten Commandments. We see it in Exodus chapter 20. Nothing wrong with thou shalt not murder. But the motivation for them, for why you shouldn't murder, is because of naturalistic reasons. You shouldn't murder because you'll be thrown into jail. You shouldn't murder because you'll end up having to go to court. Jesus is saying, no, it's something deeper than that. And so he tells them, if you're going to rightly interpret the Word of God, there's two things you're going to have to do. The first thing you got to do is check your heart and ask yourself as you read the law, as you read God's Word, what is this trying to do to my heart? What is the message here? How is it trying to align my heart to the heart of God? And then second step, you got to follow the way of Jesus. you got to follow the teachings of the kingdom, even when it doesn't feel right or even when it doesn't make pragmatic sense. Jesus is saying what God is after is your heart. No, you shouldn't murder, but not just because you'll be thrown in jail. Not just because you'll go to court. Yeah, those things will happen, but you should murder because God wants you to reconcile with your brother. This is what God is after. It kind of reminds me of when I was a youth pastor. I remember one time wanting to provide abstinence education for our young people. and We tag team with a group, a Christian group that specialized in this, and they came and they talked for a week, our teens, about abstinence. And here's what their argument was. You should abstain from sex before marriage because if you don't, you might have a pregnancy out of wedlock or you might get a disease or something worse will happen to you. As I listened to that presentation, I said, it's not that what they're saying is wrong. Yeah, I, I think you should avoid uh, sex before marriage. I, and I think, yeah, you, you don't want to have a baby out of wedlock and you want to avoid disease and all those things. But yet there's a deeper reason why we should avoid any type of sexual immorality. It's because it breaks the heart of God. It wasn't what they were saying was wrong. It was that it fell short of the gospel. What God is after is our hearts, not just us checking some box. Does that make sense? So as we read the text, what Jesus is reminding us is that if we're going to get the right interpretation, we got to do number one, check our hearts. Stop for a moment and say, Lord, what are you trying to say to me through this text about my heart? And then secondly, follow the way of Jesus, which is often a more radical way, a way that is countercultural, but follow it even if it doesn't make sense and even if it does not feel right. Let's look at the sec second law he picks up about lust. Verse number 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And that's definitely a commandment in the Old Testament. You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than the whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand caused you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Again, here's what Jesus is saying is that the Pharisees had twisted the law of Moses. You know what they did? They did what we often do. They asked, how far can we go before it's officially sin? And what they came up with was... As long as you do, do something that's short of adultery, it's not sin. It only becomes sexual sin when you've committed the act. And Jesus says, no. No, it becomes sin when your heart wants to commit the act. It becomes sin when you're looking at someone and desiring within your heart to do something other than the will of God with that person. Now imagine if we live this way. Imagine if we dealt with sin on the heart level before it ever got to the act. What would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. A whole lot of pain would be avoided. A whole lot of marriages would avoid being destroyed. A whole lot of covenants would be kept. One of the problems that they had in their day and we have in our day is instead of asking, Father, how, how far can we go to align ourselves with your heart? They were asking, how far can we go before it's sin? Folks, what God is looking for is for us to have a deep desire to align ourselves with his heart. So if we're going to get the word of God right, we have to first check our hearts and then follow the teachings of Jesus. Again, even if it doesn't feel right to our flesh or even if it doesn't make sense to our minds, there are going to be certain times 
as we read through the text that Jesus is going to tell us to do something, and we're going to say, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't seem like the pathway to success. But how many have faith in Jesus? How many believe that his teachings, even when we don't fully understand them, if we apply them, how many believe they will change our lives? How many believe that it will help us to love better and to live better? We have to have that faith. We can't wait till we have figured out and, and been able to put a formula to the teachings of Jesus. You know what I found, and this is a news flash for some, definitely was for me, and that is that God very rarely invites me into the boardroom when he's making a decision. Jesus doesn't consult with me and say, Chris, does this make sense, this commandment? Before I issue it, I just want to make sure it makes sense to you. No, there's going to be times when he says something that doesn't make sense, but follow the way of Jesus, and it will help you to love better and to live better. He goes on to talk about oath-making. He says, again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not bear or swear falsely. And again, that is from the Old Testament. It says, you shall not bear false witness. But you shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by, or by the earth, for it is the foot, his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Some of you dye it, and I know you can do that, but not in Jesus' day. Amen. Verse uh, 37, let, you, let, let what you say simply, uh, I'm sorry, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Again, Jesus highlights how the Pharisees had twisted the teachings of Jesus because of their own selfish heart. Now, the Bible does say that you should not bear false witness, right? That if you've made an oath to God, you should keep it. But what they did is they created a culture in which the only thing that a person was bound to keep was oaths that were made to God. Anything else, any other promise, if it wasn't an oath made to God, you could break it. So if you told your parents, hey, mom and dad, when you get older, I'll take care of you. But later on, you changed your mind. In their culture, you didn't have to keep that. Or if you had a business partner and you said, hey, this is the agreement, but later on it became inconvenient to keep that agreement, you could break it. Jesus says, no, we're not that type of people. We're not looking for ways to cheat others. We don't need oaths to keep our word. Jesus says, do away with all oaths. What if we lived this way? What if we lived in a way where everything we said we kept? What if we lived in a way where every promise we made we saw it as an oath. What if we lived in a way where we felt that what integrity demanded, what it meant to have our hearts aligned with God, was to keep our word? That's what Jesus wants from his followers. He was teaching his disciples how to create a new community, a counter-cultural community that was so different than the world that they were living in. But by doing it, what they would create was a community that was so different that those who were weary of a world that was full of truce breakers, a world that was full of anger and backbiting, those who were weary of that would come running in and say, I want to be a, a part of a community like this. This is what happens when we align our hearts with the heart of God. And how do we do that? We first, when we read the text, we check our hearts and say, what is this saying to me about my heart condition? And then secondly, we follow the way of Jesus. And if we do that, we'll live better and we'll love better. But to look at the next one. This one is powerful. This is actually the one that's most challenging to me. It's about retaliation. He says in verse number 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was definitely in the Old Testament. You can reference Exodus 21 and 24, Leviticus 24 and 20. It's there. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. Now, maybe you can read that without a problem, but me and Jesus are going to talk about this. When I get to heaven, I just want to have a private consult and just have a little conversation about this text. But I go on, and it says in verse number 40, and if, any, and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who will borrow, borrow from you. Jesus, again, 
challenges the way the Pharisees had smuggled their own self-interest in. What the Pharisees were do doing was twisting the law of Moses. Moses had said an eye for an eye so he could limit retaliation. They were using it to justify payback culture. Moses was saying, listen, if somebody takes your eye, you can't take their whole body. The most you can take is an eye, right? This, recipro this reciprocity, right? This limit. He was saying, if somebody takes your tooth, you can't take out their whole clan. The most you can take is their tooth. They were twisting it to say, if somebody hurts you, you have now justification for you to retaliate to the fullest extent of your desire. Jesus is saying, no, you're missing my heart. You're missing the heart of God. You're missing the original intent. What God, what God was trying to do through Moses is limit retaliation, not to justify retaliation at any price and at all cost. And so he says this, imagine for just a moment if we lived the way God wanted us to live, and that is not retaliating at all. Imagine what would happen, and I know that this seems so counterintuitive. I know that this rubs against the flesh because we celebrate this payback culture. As a matter of fact, we love those types of people who say, I don't take anything from anybody, and if you start a fight with me, I'm going to definitely finish it. We celebrate that mindset. But Jesus says that what he wants us to be is a people who says, if somebody takes from me, I'm going to still bless them. If somebody hurts me, my payback of them is going to be to love them more. That we're going to win this war not by retaliation but through love. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. had his house bombed one day while he was in service. He was in church preaching and you could hear the bomb blast go off. And he went to his house, and his house had been threatened before, but this time it was on fire when he got there. And when he got there, he saw that it was on fire, but praise God, his wife and his children had made it out safe, but he knew that the bigger problem was standing right in front of him, and it was the mob of African Americans that were angry that their leader's house had been bombed. They were ready to retaliate. They were bearing arms, some of them had guns, some of them had sticks, but they were ready to fight. You know what Dr. King did? He stood up before them and he begins to say to them that the Bible commands us to love our enemies and to bless those who curse us. And he led them in a hymn, and the hymn was Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. He taught them the way of Jesus. He taught them that the way we're going to win this war is not through retaliation, but by checking our hearts and following the way of Jesus, not when it's easy or not when it makes sense only, but we follow the way of Jesus because we have faith in him that if we follow his way, it will help us to love right and to live right. But there's two audiences that Jesus knows that's, that's before him. First is his disciples but then there's the crowd, and the crowd are not his followers yet, but they're in earshot of his teaching. And what Jesus knows is that if his followers live this way, they'll not only bless each other, but they'll impact the crowd. Because deep in the heart of the crowd is a desire to be a part of a community where there is no retaliation, where there is not the same backbiting and undermining and fighting and division, and schisms, and isms that are in the world. Folks, the people in our culture are looking for a countercultural community, and this is what Jesus was calling his earliest followers to be. The last one, my time is up, but I'll read this last one, and it's about loving your enemies. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. <laughs> i got to be honest with you. They twisted this big time. Yeah, the Bible does say, Moses' law does say, love your neighbor. But there is never any place in Moses' law that says, and hate your enemy. They added that one in because of their own selfishness. Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends his reign on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? 
And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. How in the world are we going to be perfect? It's not going to be, folks, through legalism. It's going to be through loving God and letting his perfect love flow through us. It's going to be when we say, Lord, align my heart with yours. Do you see how radical this is? You know what they had done? They had created a culture in which love was only given to neighbor, and they narrowly defined neighbor. You know who neighbor is? Neighbor is the person who's a part of your tribe, a part of your group, a person who looks like you, sounds like you, votes like you, likes what you like. But what do you do with all the people who are outside of your tribe, outside of your ethnic group, have different politics than you? What do you do with that group? Well, according to the Pharisees, you can hate them. You love your neighbor, you hate your enemy. But this isn't the way of Jesus. Jesus says, no, that wasn't the Father's intent. When you read that commandment, check your heart and then follow the way of Jesus. What was his desire? It's for us to love everybody as if they were our neighbor, even the person who is different than us. I just come back from Thailand, a land that has less than 1% of the population are Christians. But yet, the church that we were with were converting people, men and women. And how were they doing it? They were doing it by loving everyone, loving even those who are a part of other religions with the love of Christ, showing them that Christ does make a difference. What if we lived this way? What if we loved those who are different than us, instead of just trying to condemn them, instead of just trying to retaliate, what if we showed them the love of Christ? If we showed them the love of Christ, we would win. And folks, I ain't saying it's easy, because it's not. But praise God, we've been given the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we're struggling to live this way, we pray, God, help me to follow your word. But first, check my heart. Let, it, let me make sure it aligns with your word, and then let me follow you. No matter if it feels right or if it makes sense to me, let me follow your word because it will help me to live better, to love better, and it will help me to change the world on your behalf. How many want to live this way? How many want to live the blessed life? Amen? Let me say to you, if you want this life, if you want to be a part of this community and you've never given your heart to Jesus, today could be the best day of your life. I want to pray for us, but after I pray and the worship team comes, there are going to be friends at the front of this church that are here to connect with you, to pray for you, and to bring you in to this family of faith and to help you to begin to live the blessed life. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that you're a God of mercy. And I pray to Lord that our hearts will be aligned with your heart. I pray, oh God, that where we have smuggled in our own selfish desires into our reading of the text, that you would help us to be free from that. And I pray to Lord that we would love better, that we would live better, and that we would change the world on your behalf in faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen.